I teach physics at MC Squared STEM High School. Hi, I'm Andres Howard and I teach English at Lincoln West School of Science and Health. Hi, I'm Purnima Cherubu and I teach chemistry at Cleveland School of the Arts. And we have a message for all of you seniors at home right now. We know that the end of the year is tough right now. A lot of events are canceled and you're missing a lot of your, your friends. But at least you know that this is going to be the most memorable senior year experience that anyone's ever had. And eventually, you'll all be back together. You are resilient. And to my seniors, I know we were working on planning prom and graduation, and we are hoping that those things still happen. But I want you to know that if you can survive finishing high school at home, you are built to survive anything else. And as you embark on that journey going into your freshman year of college, just remember you were the class that beat the odds. Seniors, you are braver than you believe. You're stronger than you seem. You're smarter than you think. Remember, tough situations do not last forever, but tough people do. And you are tough. I want to say we love you and we believe in you and we will see you graduate. Have fun and good luck. This is Ms. Howard from Lincoln West School of Science and Health. Um, I currently teach 10th grade English in the 12th grade, senior, 12th grade senior capstone project. I hope everyone is staying home and their social distancing so that we can get back to school. I genuinely miss all of our students, all of our Wolverines at Lincoln West School of Science and Health, and I cannot wait to see you all in August. Today, I want to talk about things that we can be doing at home. Um, as I was thinking about this, I kept trying to find ways for you all to still, one, it be flexible, something that's flexible that you could do, and two, something that you can include with your family and friends. Because I just know you're tired of making TikTok videos, Snapchat challenges, what are those, streaks? Streaks, I know you're tired of those things. I'm sorry, those big things. All right, so I know you are exhausted with that. Are you ready to get back into like the group of things? Because if you don't use it, baby, you lose it. And we are not losing anything during this lockdown. We're gonna take time to actually improve some skills that we all need to be working on. The one thing that I've realized that we could seriously improve on is reading. Reading is something generic for everybody. Everyone should be reading every day. Uh, it is highly recommended that we read 20 to 45 minutes a day. Yes, 20 to 45 minutes a day. Sit in the back louder. 20 to 45 minutes a day. We need to be reading, okay? Ms. Howard reads 20 to 45 minutes a day. I am an advocate that I practice what I preach. These are the books that I have read. This one has been my favorite so far. I just finished that. Um, since we've been on lockdown, I have read these. In fact, in all of 2020, since 2020 started, um, I have read all of these three books. Right now, I'm in a phase of young adult novels. I love a coming to age story. So what I'm recommending you do, I'm actually doing. Um, a book club is something that you can do at home. So you, your parents, your siblings, your friends who you are FaceTiming, preferably FaceTiming, not actually going to see, right? Um, you are, you can do a virtual book club. S simple, easy, you can zoom in, Face you FaceTime has multiple layers. You can Snapchat about it. You can actually TikTok about it. It's things that you can do, it's ways to be creative. No, book clubs are not just for old people, okay? I actually enjoy them, so don't call me old. Um, book clubs can help you see different points of view, different perspectives. Um, you guys like to debate. I mean, how many times do you ask me for a debate? Miss Hart, can we debate? Can we debate? This is an opportunity for you to do those things. So I want to help you pick it out. Instead of me assigning something, which I will give you an option, so I'm going to give you three things. So the first is going to help you choose a book. Two, the things you should be looking through as you're reading this book to sharpen your skills and that brain, that muscle. And the third thing is going to be where you can access the books that I recommend or books, or you can scroll through and find some. The first thing we have to think about is the genre. What do you like to read? What do you like to talk about? What do you like to argue about? I personally like autobiographies. 
young adult books, um, creative nonfiction. That's like my realm. Um, I'm also into kind of like romance novels and comedies. Um, I've only read one fantasy, not my thing. So what is yours? So we have horror. We have fantasy. Comedy, yeah, we have comedy. What else do we have? Mystery, oh, I love a good mystery. Science fiction. Anime, if you like anime, I'm an advocate for that. You can read anime with your family. If they think that you're re re weird for readings, they have not read one. I sat down and read one with one of my students and I was very surprised. I actually liked it. So these are all the different things you can be doing. These are the different genres you can choose from. So I recommend choosing one genre with your family. So pick a genre that you all agree on or a genre with your friends and say like, hey, you all, this is what we're going to read, right? So let's pick a genre. Let's pick a genre as our, our example. Young adult, coming of age. Can we keep that one? Yes, because I have this one. So I want to talk about this one, The Revolution of Bertie Randolph. Okay, this is a book I finished. I highly recommend it. I love it. So when I'm looking at this and I'm reading this, I've already picked my genre, right? So we picked our genre. The next thing we have to do is we have to start reading. Just read two or three chapters. The first three chapters of a book is going to give you a good foundation of who the key play main characters are, okay? So in here, we have the main characters are Birdie. Her name is Dove, okay? We're not the main characters. These are our main characters. So we have Birdie. Her sister her, her is Birdie. She has an older sister. And then we have her parents and her Aunt Caroline. So these are like the four core... I'm not good at math, you all. So we have Birdie, <laughs> Caroline, her parents, her aunt, and her sister. So we have six key people, okay? Six key people who are going to be essential to this story. So those are our main characters. So your main characters are usually going to be found in a what first couple chapters? The first three chapters, right? So you are, the, the author is giving you who you need to have. So as you're reading this, mom, dad, aunt, uncle, sister, brother, friends, the first thing you need to choose is, yes, we need to find our genre. And then as we read, we're going to identify our main characters. Yes, we're going to identify our main characters. Now, you should be reading for how many times a night? 20 to 45 minutes. It's not a long time, okay? It may sound like a long time, but it's not a long time. We have to build our endurance with reading. And by doing that, we're going to find a book that we like, okay? what I like and then we're going to quiz ourselves so our self quiz is our main characters the first thing once you've identified your main characters you're going to move on and try to figure out what is the central conflict or main idea so what is the central conflict or main idea of the story why what is she going through so Bertie is having issues with her mother she's basically she likes to play soccer she she's hot, very intelligent very very intelligent her father's a doctor. Her mother owns a hair salon. They actually live above the hair salon. And her mother is like, you have to quit soccer. It's academics, academics. She's drilling education to her. And it's smothering. It's smothering Birdie. Like, she's just unhappy about it. So our main conflict in this story is, what is the issue? What issue is the main character having, right? So our main character is Birdie issue she's having is she wants a little bit of freedom she wants to enjoy her summer because they're going into the summer she wants her mother to release some type of stress from her okay so that we have our main character so we need to first let i'm gonna say it again because we have to get this our genre we know we're reading young adult coming of age main characters we have our, our six core people and then our conflict our conflict is that she is struggling with the pressure that her mother is giving her. She wants a little bit more freedom and she wants to kind of like enjoy her son. Also, there's a boy in here, okay, for people who like little romance. She does have a little boyfriend that she's like really into and she's a little bit worried that her parents are not going to like him. So she's dealing with that. So she wants to be free. She wants to date who she wants to date. She doesn't want to disappoint her parents. She's having a lot of internal issues, okay? I know, it sounds pretty good, right? So then we get to the climax. Okay, the climax. The climax is the height of the story. What is the brink? The brink of the story. So to just give you a brief summary. 
Side note, parents, it's always good to, as you're reading, as you can summarize. Summarize, summarize, summarize. So like a good summary of this story right now up until the point where we are going to reach our climax is going to be like, okay, so her Aunt Caroline comes to live with her. Caroline has dealt with some substance abuse issues, so she's not really that close. And Brandy didn't even know she had an aunt, okay? So this is her mother's sister. She comes to live with her. Her, she's she's observing a little bit. The aunt is observing a little bit of how the interaction between Birdie and her parents are. Birdie wants to be free. Birdie meets this little boy. She's head over heels for this boy. Um, however, he has a little bit of issues. He's been he he's been to juvenile detention, um, but he that was after his mother died. So he had kind of like a, a mental break, and he just was not happy. Since then, his father has really tried to like keep him on a straight and narrow. Birdie recognizes this. Their friends recognize this. But she's still afraid for him to meet her, her parents. So her aunt is helping her. So her sister first helps her sneak around and see this guy. She's sneaking out. Her mother's like, this is not who you are. And then she, um, I'm telling you that, this is, a, this is a really great book. Um, and then she gets to meet um, her aunt in a little bit more in-depth way because her aunt leaves. And her aunt's like, okay, well, I'll meet him as like a token. She ends up liking the guy really a lot. Um, so... They end up being like in a relationship. She's very happy about it. But the climax comes when it's an argument between her mother and her mother's sister, Caroline. Um, she's noticed a little bit of tension between the two. She's like, why are they acting this way? Do you not like her? She seems really cool and genuine. Why would you let her live with us if you didn't really care for her? Come to find out. Guys, go ahead. The climax. The climax. Why is the aunt Birdie's mother? Oh, I know. I shouldn't have told you that, but she's the mother, okay? If you want to read this, it's like, who is really good? She's the mother. That's a climax. And I'm like, oh, my God. Mic drop. Boom. So then <laughs> she's the mother, and we have to come to, like, a resolution. So we've hit. We know our genre. Whatever our main characters. We hear our central conflict. We've summarized our climax. And now... A resolution. The resolution is she has like a whole meltdown. She moves, she drives, she, her sister's in college, she drives off to her sister in college, she's like, what is going on, what's going on? They finally sit down and talk to her and explain the story of what happened. Now, because I really wanted to read the book, I've already like basically gave you tons of spoilers. I'm not going to tell you the resolution, but it really does help Birdie understand some things. It helps people, un each other, everyone understands each other at the end of this novel. Um, it was the bomb. It, it was the bomb, okay? It was really, <laughs> it was really good. It had me on my toes. Um, the next thing you want to do is after you've read a book, you've gone through all of this. So these are the things you can talk about in your, um, book club, right? You can talk about those main characters. You can talk about the climax. You can talk about the central conflict. You can talk about the resolution. The next thing that you can discuss would be like a theme. So what is the theme of this book? Um, I would think the theme is like redemption, like she's trying to, Caroline's trying to redeem herself, and I also think liberation, like liberation is a huge thing in identity. Um, I think that Birdie was trying to figure out who she was because she didn't understand who she was. Um, she was trying to feel a little bit of liberation, get some more freedom from her family, and I think Caroline was trying to redeem some things because she didn't get to raise her daughter, her sister did. So those were those are just ideas of themes. Like, what is a lesson that we want that that's coming away from us? And then we have theme. I challenge people. I challenge families. So these are this is we did the easy part. Development. That's the hard part. How did the author craft it? Like, what did it? What certain things did they do? Like, what did they say to make us understand that this was the theme or that? This was the main conflict. What what can we take from this book? Like, what can we use? So I can give an example. I knew the main conflict was liberation, or not liberation. The main conflict was that she wanted some freedom because she kept saying, like, I just, I, I love soccer, but my mother doesn't understand me. She doesn't understand that I need both. I, I have to have both. Why do I have to be stuck inside of an SAT all summer instead of hanging out with my friends? The fact that she was sneaking out of she was, she was sneaking out of the house. She was sneaking out of the house. That helped support that this is the central idea and that the climax was like, hey, this is like a breaking point. 
So what are you going to get? Like, so just find different scenarios or issues that that main character is having. That's going to help you support the development. What key things stood out to you? I think caps because our brain is a muscle. We must use it. What thinking cap did we use to help us understand it? Right? So that's where that development is coming in. Development is what from the passage helps you understand all of the story, the entire story, or different pieces of the story, or to support your argument. Because you guys like to argue. You have to have a support. Like I tell my students all the time. Without, without legs for a table, you have no foundation. So what is the foundation of your argument? What is what what is the basis of that? And that's going to come from that development. How did that author develop that theme to help you to understand, like, this is what it is? The last thing that you can talk about is, well, not the last thing, the second to last thing, author's message. What did author want you to take away from this? What do they want you to be able to understand what do they want you to, to to take like what can you use in your real life for you what, what what was their purpose why did they write this i think this author wrote this book because she wanted other girls young girls who probably are dealing with overbearing parents that you're going to be okay communication and talking and sitting down with your families is really important because your parents we don't know. I'm a mother, and I'm pretty sure I'm overbearing. We don't know everything. There's no manual that comes with parenting. But you can sit down and communicate and say, I was uncomfortable about this. Actually letting each other know where you're coming from and developing that understanding. I feel like that that was that author's message, and I'm telling you, this book is amazing. Um, and then the last thing is like a real-life connection. Can you relate to this, Arthur? Can you relate to this book? Do you know different scenarios? Your friends complain about the same thing about their parents. So we just had like a mini book club. It was kind of lit, right? I'm just telling you, it makes me want to go read this book again. So I just want to recap all the things that we have to look at. First, we're going to pick a genre. Then we're going to identify our main characters. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the main conflict. Main conflict, main idea after we've identified our main characters. What is our climax? Our resolution. The theme, the theme of this story. Development to support that theme and our real life connection. These are the core components of actually unpacking a book, looking through it and understanding it. If you do this with your friends and family, every time you read, I promise you, your writing is going to get better because once you read something like a polished piece of writing, you internally are going to know what it looks like. You're going to be better, a better writer. Your vocabulary is going to increase because the more you read, the more words you're looking at, the more you're putting into your mental toolbox. Yes, your brain is a toolbox. And the third thing is a stress reliever and it's entertainment. I know you're tired of looking. I'm tired of looking, scrolling through Instagram. So I know you're tired of scrolling through Instagram. So the next step is I want us to look at some book recommendations I have because I do have a lot. Um, I, I, I read a lot, a lot, a lot. And then I'm going to show you where you can go to download some books for yourself. The first book I'm going to recommend is Black Girl Unlimited by Echo Brown. Um, I actually literally just stopped, finished reading this book yesterday. Um, this Echo Brown is a local Clevelander. She grew up on the east side of Cleveland. And she talks about the trials and tribulations of growing up on the east side of Cleveland and how she overcame that through the idea of being a wizard. It's a very, very good book I recommend. The second one is Red at the Bone by Jacqueline Woodson. This is also a coming of age story. Jacqueline Woodson, uh, I'm pretty sure some of you have read her before. She, I'm not going to give this book away because I feel like it's, a, it's, it's too good to give away, but I recommend this one. I recommend All American Boys by Jason Reynolds and Brendan Keeley. Um, the great thing about this book is that students who are interested in br police brutality and um, social justice reform, this would be a book I recommend for you. It's written from a black and white man's perspective. They co-wrote the book. Um, it's, it's amazing. I taught it and I had the authors come in and meet my students. It was, it was an amazing experience. So if you are interested, social justice reform, uh, police brutality, this would be the book for you. Um, the Other West More 
One Name, Two Fates by Westmore. It's kind of, um, it's, again, a creative nonfiction story. Um, it's about a guy who literally lived blocks from someone who had the exact same name as him, but they ended up with two different fates. So it's a pretty good book. It's pretty good if you are into um, nonfiction, creative nonfiction, and you like listen, looking at life stories and coming of age. It's pretty cool. Um, Tyrell. Tyrell is... My students love Tyrell. I, I just can't. They love Tyrell. Tyrell was, is really good. It's about a boy whose mother is kind of like out there. His father's in jail. And they're trying to decide if he's going to have the same fate as his father. They're living in shelters. Um, he, he, and he's had to take care of his younger brother. And, of course, there's some love in there. He has a girlfriend he's trying to maintain. Um, it, it's a really good book. I, I recommend this one. Um, again, we just went over the revolution of Bertie Randolph. Okay, homegirl was killing it in this book. I think I'm gonna reread it after today. <laughs> I recommend this one. The short and tragic life life of Robert Peace. Now I have not read this book. Um, I because I read a lot of about um, girls, a lot of about young ladies. I asked for a recommendation on books that would be good for young men to read, and this was one of them. Um, I suggest people reading reading this book. Um, Letters to a Young Brother by Hill Harper is a really good read if you are struggling with some internal issues. Um, when I was an adolescent, I read Letters to a Young Sister, and it was very impactful. And now, this is how you access these books from home. Please, please look at this. So you're going to download the Libby app. Sign up, and you're going to provide your cell phone number. Choose your local library. Sign up for the library card. Browse that library collection, and boom, boom, you've got it, okay? You are going to be all set and ready to go. Download those books. You can also do audio. It is okay to do audio um, as long as you are reading along. I, I recommend it. Hey, if you are reading a, riding your bike, you're doing chores, you can't really read, but you're really interested in that book, pop that audio in. You're going to be fine. As long as you are reading and you're getting the core essence of the story, you are going to be fine. But I recommend reading along if you're going to do audio. So... That's it for me, and I hope you guys are doing well, and I hope this really, really helps. I'm looking forward to hearing about your book clubs you're going to create at home and all the things you're going to do um, when you get back. I miss you all so much. Bye-bye. This is CMSD. I am. I am. I am. Joseph. I am. Cleveland Public Schools. Hi, I'm Miss Makita from MC Squared STEM High School. We're here today to talk to you about energy. There's lots of different kinds of energy in the universe. But the really cool thing about energy is there is only one amount of energy in the entire universe. We're going to get into what's called the conservation of energy today. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means, but to begin, we'll start by looking at all the different kinds of energy that exist around you every day. And then after that, we'll design and engineer and test out a machine that changes energy from one form to another. And then I'm gonna challenge you to build one at home. We're going to start by talking about mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is the energy of anything that's moving or could move. You've probably heard of a few of these before. Kinetic energy is the energy of anything that's in motion, like this ball. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy. The amount of kinetic energy something has depends on two things, how fast it's moving and what its mass is. Anything that's moving has kinetic energy, from the molecules of air in this room to the airplanes flying in the sky. The next one is called gravitational potential energy. Now, gravitational potential energy is really cool because we take it for granted. It's what makes roller coasters really fun. It's what makes your phone fall off the table. Gravitational potential energy is the energy that something has that gives it the potential to move 
just based on how high up from the ground it is. Gravity is pulling on everything, and as long as that object has mass, and it is above the ground, it has gravitational potential energy. So I'm going to let go of this ball because it has the potential to fall. It has energy in it because it's been lifted up off the ground. <laughs> now, the higher up this ball goes, the more energy it has, the more gravitational potential energy it has. Again, all I did was change how high it is. But do you see how I lifted it up? I had to put energy into lifting it up. And that energy is going to be released when I let go of it. Another easy way to think about this is when something is lower to the ground, it has less energy. Imagine a bowling ball dropping into your hand, but only having to fall a couple inches. You're not going to feel the effects of that energy that much, are you? Now take that same bowling ball and increase its height, maybe two stories, three stories, and then try to catch it. It's going to hurt. You're going to feel that enormous amount of energy that it gained simply by increasing its height from the ground. And that's why the biggest hill on a roller coaster is always the first one, because that gives you that height that starts that um, chain of energy transformations from kinetic to potential, back to kinetic, into potential as you move through that roller coaster. The last kind of mechanical energy I want to talk about is elastic potential energy. Now this is really cool. You don't really think about a rubber band just having energy on its own, but as soon as you stretch a rubber band out, it gets really fun, right? Elastic potential energy is the energy that's stored in compressed springs, think springs that go boing, or in stretched out materials like rubber bands. You see, just like before when I lifted that ball for gravitational potential energy, when I stretch this rubber band, I'm putting energy into it by stretching it. That energy is stored in that tension in that rubber band and released for me to feel. Another common place you see elastic potential energy every day is in a ballpoint pen. Inside these pens, there's a little spring. When you press down on that spring, you're putting work, you're putting energy into that pen. It's stored in that spring and bounces right back up. It pushes that energy back out, transfers it into something else. Our machine that we built that we're going to look at pretty soon uses all three of these energies in lots of different places. See if you can find them. There are six more types of energy that we're going to talk about. The first one is sound. Did you know sound is energy? You can really, really feel that when, if you are ever in a car that's playing music really loud, or maybe at a concert, or maybe you're just playing music really loud in your room, you can sometimes feel those vibrations in the uh, materials in the air around you. Sound is energy. Right now, the sound of my voice is coming out of your TV, and that energy is traveling through the air to your ears. Chemical energy is stored in the, the bonds between molecules, and it's released when those bonds are broken. Um, the easiest place to think about that is food. Think about the last thing that you ate. That energy is stored in those molecules of food. When your body digests that food, it breaks apart those molecules, releasing all that good energy in your food and fueling your body with it. That's chemical energy. Also, the gasoline in a car. We put gas in a car, and the car's engine transforms that gas into all different kinds of energy. It transforms it into sound coming out of the stereo. It transforms it into heat coming out of your heater. It transforms it into kinetic energy, making the car move. And nuclear energy. Now, you probably don't experience nuclear energy transformations around you every single day, but they exist. We have nuclear power plants not too far from, from Cleveland. Nuclear energy is stored in the bonds between atoms, within atoms, I mean, within atoms, and it's released two different ways. One is fission, and fission is when we break atoms apart and release enormous amounts of energy. And the other one is fusion. Fusion is when we smash atoms together 
and create new atoms from those. Incredible amounts of energy are released there. Fusion is what fuels the sun. In the sun, hydrogen atoms come together and form helium atoms and release incredible amounts of energy during that process. Thermal energy or heat energy is caused by the motion of particles or molecules. The more something's moving, the more heat or thermal energy it has. Light bulbs take electrical energy and turn them into light, obviously, but they also transform that energy into thermal energy, which is why light bulbs are hot when you touch them. Another kind of energy is called radiant energy. This includes the energy of the light coming from the sun, but it also includes a few other things on the electromagnetic spectrum. Radiant energy can also be called electromagnetic energy, and it includes things like x-rays, gamma rays, UV rays, um, radio waves that satellites use to communicate, infrared rays, which is what your TV remote uses to talk to your TV. And lastly, electrical energy. You've all experienced electrical energy, but the neat thing about electrical energy is you see it being converted or transformed into a lot of these other kinds of electricities or energies all around you every day. Think about a cell phone that lights up when your friend calls you. That's electrical energy turning into light energy, but it also vibrates. That's electrical energy being transformed into kinetic energy. Maybe you're playing your favorite song. That's electrical energy being transformed into sound energy. Or maybe you have too many apps open on your phone and it overheats. That's electrical energy being transformed into heat energy. These energy transformations are all around you. See if you can find some. Energy is transforming all over the universe from one form to another. But the really cool thing is that there is a set amount of energy in the universe. The amount of energy that exists never changes. We can't create it. We can't destroy it. We can only transform it from one type to another. This is what scientists call the law of conservation of energy. Now the really cool thing is we can have some fun with it. A really neat project that demonstrates the law of conservation of energy is called the Rube Goldberg machine. Now, Rube Goldberg was a cartoonist, inventor, engineer about a hundred years ago, but he was most famous for coming up with these comic strips, these cartoons that showed really long chain reactions of energy turning into other kinds of energy, huge chain reactions to accomplish really, really simple tasks. Imagine a chain reaction of dozens of steps just to turn a light switch on. Seems kind of unnecessary, right? But it's actually really fun. Um, these machines can have just a few steps. They can have a whole bunch. But they all, all rely on the law of conservation of energy. Knowing that with just a little bit to start, we can change that energy into another kind, into another kind, into another kind, and keep that reaction, that, that chain reaction going until we accomplish whatever task you've set out to do. Uh, and the best part about Rube Goldberg machines are you can use anything you have around you. You don't have to have a fancy lab, you don't have to have any fancy equipment. You can just use the stuff to your left and to your right. Look around. Now I built a Rube Goldberg machine. Are you ready to see it? Try to identify the different forms of energy as you go along. And try to identify the different changes in energy as you go along. Ready? Come on.
it's your turn. See if you can build your own Rube Goldberg machine. Start small, two or three steps, and then add on to it as you get the hang of it. You can use anything that you have around you. That's the best part. You can use books, you can use toys, kitchen utensils. You can even use things that were headed for your trash or your recycling. I did. And you can work with your family. Or you can do it alone if you want to. No matter what though, if you're building a Rube Goldberg machine, you are following something called the engineering design process when you build. The engineering design process is a framework. It helps us figure out how to solve problems. Do you consider yourself an engineer? Maybe? Well, if you've ever had an idea and planned that idea out and tinkered with it, played around with it, tested it out, then you're an engineer. And you are using the engineering design process without even realizing it. I used the engineering design process when I built my Rube Goldberg machine, but I wasn't looking at a chart to do it. This is something that we do naturally when we're trying to figure out solutions to problems. We always start by asking a question. What's the problem you're trying to solve? What's the solution you're trying to come up with? In my case, I wanted to raise a flag. That's what I was trying to figure out. Then you start to imagine. You come up with ideas. You do some research. When I was building, this step for me looked like watching a lot of YouTube videos. But you know what? Those YouTube videos of other people's Rube Goldberg machines gave me lots and lots of good ideas. Because then from there, I planned. Planning is where you narrow down your ideas. Maybe it involves making a blueprint or sketching. I made lots of sketches while I was planning. All kinds of ideas of elements that I could have in my Rube Goldberg machine that I might have used in the end, might not have, but it was definitely worth planning. Then you create. You take that plan and you make something out of it. Now, I didn't build my Rube Goldberg machine in one day. I didn't build it in two days. If you know me, I can't do anything small, but, you know, take your time with it. Experimenting and building is the fun part. This is where you put your ideas into action. You start connecting those elements in your Rube Goldberg machine. Once you've created it, you can test it out. See if it actually works. Now, Rube Goldberg machines are tricky. You might have a really cool plan, a really cool sketch, and then you even put it together. But when it comes time to test it, it does not work. It might not work the first time, or the second time, or the third time. But that's okay, because in the engineering design process, you don't just give up and scrap it. You play around with it. You do what engineers call tinkering with it. You troubleshoot it. You see if you could figure out how to make that element work. This is where you are improving on your test. Hit a snag, fix it. Play around with it until it works. And then once it finally works, this is the best part. Share. Share your creation. Just like I shared my Rube Goldberg machine with you. Good luck building your own Rube Goldberg machine. There's energy being transformed all around us. And with a Rube Goldberg machine, you can really see how fun that can be. Bye. This is the MSD. I am. I am. I am Josue. I am Cleveland Public Schools. Hello, I'm Mrs. Cherubu and I teach chemistry at Cleveland School of the Arts and I'm really excited to be here. Today, I would like to discuss physical and chemical changes with you. I know, I understand that you already know about it, so let's examine them more closely. First, let's go over the definitions of physical and chemical changes. In a physical change, that's how the definition would go, if a substance undergoes a physical change, then no new substance is formed.
That means during a physical change, the substance does not change into a new substance. On the contrary, if a substance undergoes a chemical change, then it changes into a new substance, which means that during a chemical change, a new substance is formed. So let's recap real quick the physical and chemical changes. So in a physical change, no new substance is formed, whereas in a chemical change, a new substance is formed. So let's examine this by looking at an actual process. So I have some melting ice, as you can see. So what process is this? It's melting, right? Is this a physical or a chemical change? I hear you loud and clear. It's a physical change. That's right. It is a physical change. So my next question is why? Why do you think it's a physical change? And I still hear, it, hear you loud and clear, even though I don't see you. Because no new substance is formed. Absolutely. However, we still want to examine it more closely. Anytime you're representing a change in science, it has to be represented in the form of an equation. So our starting material in this case was ice. So I'm going to write down an ice first. And this ice is changing, so I represent change by an arrow, into liquid water. So I write down water on the other side. This arrow also represents the direction of change. So this whole equation is showing us the change that we just observed. Now let's examine both the substances or both the things on either sides. We have ice on one side and water on the other side. If I ask you, what is the chemical composition of water? By chemical composition, I mean to say what kind of elements it's made of and in what ratio. So let's examine water. It is universally known that the chemical formula of water is, and I hear it loud and clear, H2O, absolutely. So the chemical formula of water is H2O. What does that mean? That means water is made of hydrogen and oxygen and the ratio of hydrogen and oxygen is 2 to 1. And that's what chemical composition is. This is also called as chemical makeup. And the way we represent chemical composition or chemical makeup of any substance is in the form of chemical formula like H2O. All right, now let's examine ice. Let's figure out what ice is made of. We all know that ice melts into liquid water, right? So intuitively, ice should be same as water. And therefore, the chemical formula of ice is also H2O. Since on either side, the substances are the same substance, there is no new substance that's being formed. Therefore, we know that melting is a physical change or it's a physical process. Similarly, boiling, when you boil something, you are changing the state of that substance from liquid to gas or steam, right? And therefore, it's simply a physical change. Just like when you're melting, you're simply changing the form of a substance from solid to liquid, but you're not changing the substance into a new substance. And therefore, again, it's a physical change. So I have this cast iron pot that I accidentally left outside this winter. And guess what happened? The lid got rusted. I want you to examine the picture that's being shown on the screen. What do you see? Yes, tremendous amount of rust. So what's the question now? You all know my question is, is, it a, is rusting a physical or a chemical change? And I can hear you loud and clear. Yes, it is a chemical change. But let's examine it more closely. Again, how do we represent a change? We represent a change in the form of an equation. We always start with a starting material. A starting material in this case is iron, right? And so this iron, when exposed to air and moisture, in the presence of moisture, it reacts with oxygen to make rust. So iron is changing into rust. 
we already declared that it's a chemical process, or it's a chemical change. However, we need to scrutinize it more closely to understand why it is a chemical change, just to be sure. All right, in order to do that, we need to differentiate these two substances. We need to claim or we need to make an assertion through evidence that rust is a different substance than iron. How can we do that? We can do that by examining the physical properties of both of these substances. So let me tell you, we identify and we differentiate substances based on their physical properties. Now the question is, what are physical properties after all? Physical properties are properties that we observe through our five senses. Our sense of vision, a sense of smell, a sense of taste, a sense of hearing, and a sense of touch. And so the properties that we can examine is the appearance of a substance, for example, what the color is, whether the substance has shine or luster or whether it is dull, whether the substance is smooth or textured, whether the substance is hard or soft. We can also examine whether the substance can be a good conductor of heat and electricity. We can also examine whether a substance is malleable. That means it can be beaten down into different molds or shapes or thin sheets. Whether it's ductile, that means whether it can be drawn into thin wires or whether the substance is, um, has a specific boiling point, that means the temperature at which it boils, or it has a specific melting point, which is the temperature at which it melts. So all these properties can be examined by our five senses and they are called as physical properties. And it's the physical properties that primarily allow us to identify a substance and to differentiate two substances. So let's examine or let's figure out the physical properties of iron. So I want you to look at iron on the screen and I want you to tell me what color is iron? And I hear you loud and clear, it's gray, absolutely right. Now, the next thing I want you to look at is, does this iron that you see on the screen, does it have any shine or it's a dull substance? Well, I do see it has shine or luster. So definitely iron has shine or luster. Is it smooth or does it have a rough surface? It might have some texture, but it does look smooth in the image. So I'm gonna write down that iron has a smooth surface. Um, is it hard or is it soft? It's a hard substance, absolutely. Do you think it is a good conductor of heat and electricity? We all know that metals are good conductors of heat and electricity and iron is a metal, so it should be a good conductor of heat and electricity. Moreover, we also know that all our pots and our pans, right? They are all made of metals, primarily iron in them, and therefore, it, it, we can assume that they are good conductors of heat and electricity. And we know electric ca cables, they are all made of um, copper primarily. So copper is a metal just like iron and therefore it's a good conductor of electricity. Um, is it attracted by a magnet? Do you think iron has magnetic properties? Absolutely, we all know that iron is magnetic. Now let's compare let's compare the properties of iron with properties of rust. Does, is rust also gray in color? Absolutely no, it's reddish brown in color or orangish in color. Reddish brown in color. All right, uh, does it have luster or shine? Absolutely not. It does not have luster, it's dull in color. Is it smooth? To me it looks more flaky, it looks rough. So I'm gonna write down rough. Is it hard? As I said, it's not hard, right? If you try to hold that rust in your hand, it's going to crumble in your hand. So definitely it's very fragile and it's very flaky. So I'm going to write down flaky. And you know what happens to rusted cars, right? Have you seen the parts of the cars, uh, the cars losing parts of uh, their body because of rusting, right? Is it a good conductor of heat and electricity? Do you think rust is a good conductor of heat and electricity? Well, I would start thinking about that question more logically, even though I know you're saying no, but if you think about the rationale, what is the rationale behind our thinking? It could be because we have never seen parts and pans made of rust. We have never seen electric cables made of rust. So we know 
for sure the rust is not a good conductor of heat and electricity so i'm going to put down a cross next to it do you think rust has magnetic property do you think it can be attracted by a magnet well i want you to explore this on your own i want you to find a piece of metal piece of iron that's rusted and find out the magnet look for a magnet in the house you may find it in your cabinet latches or sometimes it's present in toys um, get hold of a magnet if you possibly can and test any rusted stuff that you can see around the house if you don't have any rusted iron in the house then you can take a small paper clip which is made of steel which is also primarily iron and leave it in water for a few days and then next thing you're going to see is beautiful rust forming all over it and then you can test it so this is something i'm going to leave it up to you to explore and figure out whether it's um, magnetic all right now let's examine the properties of rust and the properties of iron is there any commonality is there anything that's common between the two absolutely no the properties of rust are totally different from the properties of iron therefore emphasizing on the fact that rust is a totally new substance it's a totally different substance from iron and therefore this is a chemical change let's quickly go over the attributes of chemical reaction by attributes i mean the characteristics or the indicators of a chemical reaction so during a chemical reaction heat energy may be released or it could be produced so there is absorption or release of heat during a chemical reaction not all this but in most of the reactions you will notice that also in some reactions may result in production of gas like carbon dioxide in case of baking um, and, and so that's another indicator of a chemical reaction. Chemical reactions may also result in change in color of the end product, something we noticed in baking as well. Chemical reaction can also result in change in smell and also change in taste. And all these attributes we noticed in baking. So these are the indicators of chemical reaction. If you um, are able to see three or more of these indicators being satisfied, in, in a process or in a change, then you know with certainty that it is a chemical reaction. Baking certainly is a chemical reaction because it satisfies the last four indicators of chemical reaction. Now I will demonstrate few changes and you have a task of determining whether they are physical or chemical changes by following these guidelines. Number one, write the equation of each change. The equation is something that represents the change. You have to start with the initial material and then make an arrow and on the other side of the arrow you should write the end product. Number two, compare the properties of starting material with the end product. So please compare the properties of your starting material with the end product. If the properties are the same, that means you have the same substance. If the properties are different, that means you have two different substances, which means it's a chemical change. Number three, please look for any indicators of chemical change. Number four, draw your conclusion. All right, so let's start, get started. All right, so my first change is a lit candle. So I want you to follow the process and determine whether this is a physical or a chemical change. Make sure you're writing down your reasoning. Next is, I have this lighter, which I simply have lit it. It has butane in it. That's the liquid that actually burns. So physical or a chemical change, that's number two. Third, I have a plain sheet of paper, which has been folded into airplane. Is it a physical or a chemical change? Number three, sorry, number four, I have this apple that was peeled and was left exposed to air for several hours. Is it a physical or a chemical change? I want to show you a freshly peeled part of an apple just to compare. This is a freshly peeled part of an apple and that part of an apple was exposed to air for several hours. Did it go through a physical or a chemical change? Right, number three, sorry, number five, 
I have a packet of Kool-Aid and I have a glass of water. So these are my initial ingredients and I'm going to mix them together. So I add my Kool-Aid powder into water and then I dissolve it by mixing it thoroughly and now I have a Kool-Aid solution. What kind of process is this? Physical or chemical? Make sure you're writing down the evidences. Last but not the least, I have baking soda, which I'm going to pour in this glass. And then I'm going to pour some vinegar on top of it. And this is one of those classical um, experiments that many of you must have observed and done on your own. So there is tremendous amount of fizzing that you may notice. Is it a physical or a chemical change? All right, so now I have a task for you for the rest of the week. I want you to explore physical and chemical changes within your homes and in your neighborhoods. Capture them as photos, as videos, you know, sketches, paintings, create a model, write a poem, make a rap, do whatever entertains you, make it fun and creative. Please write in a few sentences why you think the changes that you so creatively captured, they are physical or chemical changes. And we would love to see your creations. So email if possible, your creations to us. For clarification and questions, uh, please do not hesitate to reach out. Thank you and have a wonderful week.